Hi, everyone. I'm Judith Hank with Beyond Plastics. Thanks so much for joining us tonight for this important and exciting webinar. A word about Beyond Plastics. We're a nonprofit project based at Bennington College in Vermont, where I teach. And we have the audacious goal of working to prevent plastic pollution everywhere. And we're serious about it. We don't think any community should have to carry the burden of plastic pollution. I'm privileged to serve as the president and the founder of Beyond Plastics. And prior to that, I served as uh, EPA regional administrator in the Obama administration. I like to think of us as a feisty little startup uh, without the fat salaries. Uh, we have a wonderful team working round the clock on plastics issues. And this issue is huge. It's a climate change issue. Plastics is very much an environmental justice issue. It's an oceans issue. By 2025, for every three pounds of fish in the ocean, there'll be one pound of plastic. And I find that unconscionable that we are turning our ocean into a watery landfill. And I'm a huge supporter of recycling. I started my town's recycling program in upstate New York, but plastics recycling has been an abysmal failure. And a big reason why so many of you have tuned in uh, today is because of the health issues related to plastics. At Beyond Plastics, we focus on reducing the production, use, and generation of plastics, not plastic recycling. And we're highly motivated to do that because of the health concerns. We're working in state legislatures around the country to reduce packaging and to, all, to also organize against the plastic industry's latest attempt uh, to deal with this problem so ineffectively. They're promoting chemical recycling, which we call false recycling. So I'm going to hand the privilege of introducing Dr. Phil Landrigan over to my colleague, Dr. Megan Wolf. But I just wanna say, I am so grateful that Dr. Landrigan is with us this evening. I have known Dr. Landrigan for over 30 years. Uh, if you have not read his amazing National Academies of Science report called Pesticides in the Diet of Infants and Children, you should read it. Um, it changed the law, the federal law on pesticides issues. I'm a New Yorker. I very much appreciate Dr. Landergan's work protecting the health of 9-11 first responders. I can go on and on, but let me please um, turn the floor over to my amazing, talented colleague, Dr. Megan Wolf. Thank you so much, Judith. Well, welcome everybody. My name is Megan Wolf. I'm the policy director at Beyond Plastics and I'm amazed and thrilled with the turnout tonight. I'm so glad to see so many of you here. And it's also my ple pleasure and privilege this evening to introduce Dr. Philip Landrigan, who's going to be speaking to us, as you know, on the human health effects of plastic. Now, Philip Landrigan is a pediatrician and an epidemiologist. He directs the Program for Global Public Health and the Common Good and the Global Observatory on Planetary Health at Boston College. His research examines health impacts of toxic environmental chemicals. But to introduce him that way is actually really to bury the lead. I first became aware of Dr. Landrigan's work almost the instant I set foot inside a school of public health. Seemingly since he graduated medical school, he's been almost everywhere we've needed him. For example, in the 1970s, his studies of lead at the CDC demonstrated that low level lead exposure reduces children's IQ, a finding that contributed to the EPA's 1975 decision to remove lead from paint and gasoline. That action reduced blood lead levels by 95% and increased the IQ of all American children born since 1980. In the 1990s, Dr. Landrigan's documentation of children's exquisite sensitivity to pesticides contributed to the enactment of the Food Quality Protection Act of 1996, which is the only federal environmental law in the United States that contains explicit provisions to protect children's health. In that same decade, he helped to establish the EPA's Office of Children's Health Protection. 
From 1985 to 2018, he was a member of the faculty of the Econ School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, where he served as chairman of the Department of Preventative Medicine, professor of pediatrics, and dean for global health. In a more recent role, he co-chaired the Lancet Commission on Pollution and Health, which reported in 2018 that pollution causes 9 million deaths annually, and that pollution is preventable. It's feasible and cost-effective to do so, and it saves lives. Since 2019, he's led the Monaco Commission on Human Health and Ocean Pollution, which is how I've come to know him and why Judith and I prevailed on him to speak to us tonight. Dr. Landrigan has a nose for toxins and his attention to the chemical additives associated with plastics has helped to bring focus to what is proving to be a very significant issue. But I don't need to say much more. Dr. Landrigan is one of the clearest and most knowledgeable presenters on the health impacts of plastic and we're lucky to have him here tonight. So I'll let him tell it. Megan, Judith, um, thank you very much. Thanks to all 483 of you who are here this evening. It's a privilege to talk with you. So I'm going to talk about plastics impacts on human health. I'm going to use my slides. So let me just do the mechanics here and we'll get going. There, can you see that okay? Okay, good. So what I'm gonna do is talk about plastics impacts on human health and put it in the framework of something that's called the planetary health concept, which is something that dates back now about eight years to the something called the Lancet Commission on Planetary Health. Lancet's a big medical journal in the UK. And the very distinguished group who wrote this to find planetary health as a science that looks at how human health is related to the health of the planet. Or to put it another way, it's a, it's a branch of, of medical science, biological science, that looks at how the damage we do to the planet comes back to bite us. That's really what, what planetary health is all about. And here's a, here's a diagram that the Lancet people put together. So over there on the left is, is individual health. The, when you go to, your, to see your doctor, that's, that's what you're dealing with for the most part is your individual health. But um, planetary health, uh, beyond the individual health, there's public health, the health of populations, global health, one health, which is a concept that examines our, the relationship of us humans to the, all the other living creatures on the world, everything from mosquitoes to whales, how their health influences our health, which became very obvious and painfully present during COVID, the disease that originated in bats. And then fin finally, planetary health is the broadest concept of all. It examines how the health of the whole planet, the air, the water, the ocean, the animals, the people around us, how do they affect human health? And it's only by understanding these complicated connections that we can really understand the full magnitude of what plastic is doing to us and to our planet. So here are some of the, here's a couple of concrete examples of how damage to the planet is damaging human health, climate change, biodiversity loss, uh, uh, diminishing fresh water, so on many, many different dimensions of this and uh, degradation of the soil. And some people in Sweden at the Stockholm Environment Institute uh, wanted to do a little better job of mapping out what planetary health is all about. And so what they did was they came up with what they call nine domains. These are the domains uh, shown around the circumference of the circle here. Climate change and uh, 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 loss of the ozone layer and uh, uh, phosphorus pollution and so on. And um, it's a way of operationalizing uh, the concept of planetary health. Just so you can, it's actually a dashboard, so you can see where we are. So, for example, with regard to biodiversity loss, which is over here at about eight o'clock, we're already we've already lost so many species that we're deep into the red zone on biodiversity loss. Nitrogen and phosphorus pollution, which mainly comes from fertilizers, applied in agriculture. Again, we're into the red zone. Climate change, we're getting there. We're not there yet. And then others, there's less information. So Johan Rockstrom, who's the man who invented this concept, said that planetary boundaries define 
the safe operating space for humanity. Uh, I'm a veteran of the United States Navy, and I've spent time uh, with submarine people. I do not serve on submarines, but I served as a medical doctor to the subservice. And submarines need to have, uh, think of a submarine as a small planet. It has to have enough water, enough air, enough food, the right temperature. And if any of those things go awry, the the boat has to come to the surface. It cannot survive or it goes to the bottom and everybody dies. And spaceship Earth, submarine Earth, is the same, the same idea. We have these boundaries that define what temperature is good for us, what's too hot, what's too cold, what's just right, how much oxygen do we need, how much fresh water do we need, and so on. And that's that's what planetary boundaries are all about. So where does plastic fit in? Where does plastic fit into this concept? Well, first of all, you have to we have to understand what plastic is. They're they're man-made chemical materials. And there's really two components. I'm going to show you a picture in a moment and just giving you a better sense of how this works. But basically, every plastic has a has a backbone. The reason the reason plastic holds together and doesn't just pour out of the glass like water is that it has a backbone called a polymer, some, sometimes called a resin, which holds the whole thing together. Think of it as a skeleton. And then lots of other chemicals, which I've listed here, are added to that skeleton to, to convey particular properties like color or flexibility or the ability to resist heat and light. And a lot of those additives are very toxic. For the most part, they have not been properly tested for toxicity before they came to market. They're just brought to market by the chemical and plastics industry because regulations are very lax in most countries. And these chemicals that are put into plastic, chemical plastics that we, we and our kids deal with every single day, they include carcinogens, chemicals that can cause cancer, neurotoxicants that cause brain damage, and endocrine disruptors that can hack and scramble the immune, uh, sorry, the endocrine signaling system that connects all the different organs in the human body. Another thing about plastic that I don't think everybody realizes, just don't think it through, is that almost all of the stuff, 98, 99% of it, is made from fossil carbon, from coal, from oil, from gas. And we'll talk in a few minutes about how oil and coal and gas get to be turned into plastics, but the important thing is that they all come from fossil carbon. So I like to talk about the chemical and plastics revolution, the notion that in my lifetime, I was born in 1942, and in my lifetime, hundreds of thousands of new chemicals and plastics have been released to the environment. It's, it's really, it's just a fundamental sea change in the way humans relate to the planet and thus to planetary health. So here's a graph. This shows chemical production in the United States from 1947, right after World War II, when this all began <clears throat> until 2007. And then this picks up the story and takes it forward to 2016. And you can see that over this 75 year period, plastic and chemical production have been going up at roughly about 3%, 3.5% per year, year after year, after year like compound interest. And, and right now we're just uh, surrounded uh, on every level by plastics and synthetic chemicals that our grandparents and our great grandparents never encountered. This is new uncharted territory for humanity's relationship with the planet on which we live. Well, the way it works, I mentioned, I mentioned that regulations in most countries are, are really very weak. Chemical companies do not need to test chemicals for safety or toxicity before they bring them to market. It's very different from drugs and vaccines. Anybody who's followed the COVID story knows that it's not possible to bring a drug or a new vaccine to market without extensive safety and toxicity testing, which is overseen by the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA. But by contrast, regulation of chemicals in the United States and most countries is very weak. And chemical manufacturers, plastic manufacturers, are under really no obligation to test chemicals or to provide data on the toxicity of chemicals to the public or, or to the government. They just, uh, the engineers come up with a new molecule, they put it into a product, looks good, they like it, gonna make a profit, goes out to market. So 
their new chemicals are brought to the market with lots of enthusiasm, but no scrutiny. And then what happens is that belatedly, sometimes years, sometimes even decades after these chemicals have come onto the market, they're found to have caused great harm to the environment and great harm to human health. This black and white picture in the middle here down at the bottom, that's DDT. DDT was hailed as a miracle chemical when it was brought to market in the 1940s. A powerful insecticide that was used to kill malaria, uh, to kill mosquitoes that carried malaria. And it was thought to be so benign that people like this little boy on the beach here, that's Jones Beach in New York City, uh, would run through the cloud behind the, behind the truck. I grew up in Boston and, and the DDT truck used to roll through the streets in August, September during, during mosquito season. And I got really angry at my parents who would not let me do what this little guy is doing, which is get out there and run through that cloud because it was just the coolest thing in the world. And we knew that chemicals meant better living, better living through chemistry was the, was the phrase back then. So what the, the current situation with chemicals, and, and these include plastics, which are just a form of chemical, is that there are something like 350,000 manufactured synthetic chemicals on earth today. They're made from oil and gas and coal. Most are new materials. They're used everywhere. Just think of, look, sit, look around the room in which you're sitting. You can probably see a dozen, 20, 30 items made out of plastic, everything from carpets to computers, to iPhones, to wall coverings, curtains, furniture. Uh, these chemicals don't stay in plastic. They don't, they get out, they leak out of the plastic, they get into the environment and they're everywhere from six miles beneath the surface of the Pacific in the Marianas Trench to the North Pole. We're all exposed. The CDC in the United States rolls through the United States every year they do, excuse me, they do something called the N. Haynes survey, which takes blood samples and urine samples from people all across the United States. It's a rolling survey that goes on year after year. And they pick up measurable levels of 200 to 300 manufactured chemicals in every one of us, men, women, newborn babies, the elderly, pregnant women. We've all got these chemicals in us. Newborn infants are exposed to these chemicals in the womb because when they get into the body of a pregnant woman, they cross right over and get into her baby. <clears throat> Although we are all exposed to these chemicals, almost nobody escapes. There is no question that the poor, minorities, marginalized people, indigenous uh, communities in this country are disproportionately exposed because the factories that make these products are and the pipelines that carry the oil and gas are disproportionately placed in poor minority and indigenous neighborhoods, environmental injustice. And the, the show goes on. Chemicals are continuing to increase at three, three and a half percent per year. It is predicted that for every pound of chemical that we have on the earth today, we'll have two pounds in about 25 years by about 2040, 2045 if current trends continued. And that's that's the rub. Are they going to continue at that rate? That's why we're here tonight. So here's a little diagram that tries to explain what plastic is. I mentioned that plastic has a backbone, which is composed of carbon atoms joined together in long, long chains or long sheets. And that provides the skeleton. And here, these two blue arrows, purple arrows are showing you the bonds between the carbon atoms, the chemical bonds that hold it all together. And then all these chemicals, phthalates, bisphenol A's, PFAS chemicals, frame retardants, are popped in to the skeleton. They're sort of stuck in there. They're not chemically attached. They're not glued in. They just sit there. They're kind of stuck in between the folds of the, of the, of the resin, and, and there they sit until they don't sit there any longer. And these chemicals aren't just little dots like I've shown here. It's hard to show this stuff to scale. But in a lot of plastics, they actually make up half the weight, 50% of the weight of the plastic product, like the little rubber ducky that a child takes into the bathtub in the evening. 
So this is how it all began. This is what the, the bright dawn of the plastic age. This is a picture in Life magazine from 1955, when most of us didn't exist. And here's this is the legend that was in the magazine under the picture. It was it was praised as throw away throw away living, disposable items that cut down household chores. And it says the objects flying in this picture would take 40 hours to clean, except no housewife need bother because they're all meant to be thrown away after use. How wonderful. So back then in 1955, truth be told, plastic waste was not a big problem. It was still pretty exotic stuff. But today, of course, the situation is very different. So here's a graph. This is a graph showing us how much plastic has been produced since it all began in 1955. In 1955, 1 1.7 million tons were produced when that little man was throwing plastics up in the air. And today we have um, more than 400 million tons being produced each year. The, the total amount of plastic that has been pr produced over these uh, 70 years or so is eight gigatons. That's eight billion tons of plastic. Extraordinary. And that amounts to about one ton for every person on Earth. There's about eight billion people on the planet, 7.8, something like that. And it's still going up. It's going to double by 2040. It's going to treble by 2060 if we stay on the track we are on today. And the biggest increase, by far the biggest increase in plastic production is single-use plastic. Think of the packaging on a CD, the trash bag that you put in, in the bag with your trash, the, the plastic bag that comes home with the dry cleaning, uh, the packaging when you go to the supermarket and you have to rip off three layers of plastic to get to the, to the fruit salad. All of that stuff is single-use plastic, gets thrown in the trash, gets thrown in the recycling, and this now amounts for close to 40% of production, and it is the most rapidly growing uh, component of plastic production. Making plastic takes a lot of energy. You have to burn oil and coal and gas to do the complicated chemical reactions that turn oil and coal and gas into plastic. It's very energy intensive and produces large amounts of greenhouse gases. And every year, about 20 uh, megatons of plastic waste is released to the environment. So here's the ocean. The ocean has been badly damaged by plastic, as Judith Enk mentioned in the introduction. Uh, eight to 12 of the, about 20, 22 million tons of plastic get thrown away every year. About half of that, eight to 12 million ton, metric, uh, megatons, not million tons, eight to 12 megatons enters the ocean mostly comes in from land, some from, from ships. What happens is the, the plastics in the ocean, I'm sure you've seen the terrible pictures. I've got one coming up on the next slide showing how plastics trap and kill whales and turtles, fish and birds, kill them. Then what happens though, is that in the ocean environment, which is very harsh, wind and weather and tide and storms, the plastics break down. They break down into smaller and smaller particles called microplastics. And I like to think of these microplastics as little, little Trojan horses because they contain all of the chemicals, all of those additives that were put into the plastic when the plastic was made. And, it, and they carry those additives around with them. And they contaminate the ocean, they fall to the floor of the sea, but they don't stay there. What happens is they get into the creatures in the sea creatures in the sea eat everything that's moving. They see a little plastic particle falling down through the water column and a fish swims over and gobbles it up. And when we eat the fish or the oysters or the mussels or the lobsters that ingested those plastics, those plastics get into us. And once the little particles are in a living body, whether it's a fish body or a human body, they leach out they can slide out of the plastic, they can escape from the polymer, and they get into your bloodstream, start moving around, enter the organs of your body, your child's body, 
and they can cause damage. So here's here's macroplastics, which means simply the, the big stuff that you can see. You can't see the microplastics except with a microscope. And this is what mac macroplastics do. This is a, a an abandoned fish net floating in the sea and it's trapped this sea turtle. So you might ask yourself, why are chemical and plastic pollution increasing so rapidly? I mean, this is extraordinarily rapid. This is faster than inflation, 3.5% uh, per year. Why is it going up so fast? And it's not an accident. What's going on is that the fossil carbon industry is pivoting away from making fuels and they're switching their energy and their investment into plastic. What, one of the things that we all have to understand is that this is what's called a, a vertically integrated industry. And what that means is that the same companies like Exxon, Gulf, Chevron, the same companies that pull oil and coal and gas out of the ground are also the same companies that produce petrochemicals and, and plastic, Vertic, vertical integration. They, com they control the whole supply chain. So they can they have the ability to make this pivot and they're switching away from making fuel to be burned for heating, for transportation. And they're putting their investment into plastics. Why are they doing this? Well, the first one driver is the global transition to green energy. I just read in the New York Times this morning that the production of, of uh, electric cars is increasing at three times faster than was predicted even two years ago. The global transition to green energy is moving very rapidly, a lot faster than a lot of people thought it would, a lot faster than I thought it would. And all of a sudden, Exxon can't sell you gasoline anymore to put into your car because you've got an electric car. But they're sitting on all this gasoline, they're sitting on all this natural gas and coal. So uh, they need to find a market for it. After all, money doesn't want to sleep. And so it's this pivot which is the driver of this extraordinary increase in, in plastic production. And, and you have to understand that single-use plastics are right at the center of this strategy because it, think of it this way. For, if you're the head of Exxon, the best way to make a buck on plastic is to take your oil, take your natural gas, put it into a piece of plastic that's going to be used just once and then thrown into the trash or thrown into the recycling. That's like, that's like gold because the, the customer is going to need another one tomorrow and another one the day after and so on. It's an unending source of wealth to use these single-use throwaway plastics. Here's a little graphic showing how uh, gas production, gas and oil production have increased in the United States over the last uh, uh, 15 years since 2008. You can see that in, when it comes to oil, the U.S. has come up here where that we were for, previously we were behind Russia and Saudi Arabia. Now we're coming up, but when it comes to gas, Saudi Arabia is way down. Russia is in the middle, and the United States is in first place. And when you put them together, the USA is the world's leader now. We're producing more gas and more oil than either Russia or Saudi Arabia, and that's been a boon for Exxon and Gulf and Chevron, but. Given that markets for fossil fuels are going down, they're asking themselves, where can we put all this oil? Where can we put this gas? And where they're putting it, of course, is into plastics. Here's the pipeline network that carries the gas and the oil across the country. You have epicenters of production down here on the te Texas, Louisiana, Gulf Coast, out here in the Permian Basin in West Texas, part of New Mexico, here in Oklahoma, and then up here in Appalachia in West Virginia, Western Pennsylvania. So those pipelines are not benign. No right thinking person wants one in her backyard because they catch fire, because they leak, and then kids get into the oil and the crud that they leak. And because compressor stations like this one in Quincy, Massachusetts, North Weymouth, Massachusetts, are often put right in the middle of neighborhoods. You can see the houses right behind here. By the way, this one is on the coast. If we have a good northeaster, the whole thing is going to be inundated. And environmental injustice surrounds pipelines and compressor stations at every step of the way. It's no accident that these 
facilities are put into poor black, brown, low income and indigenous communities. Uh, Chevron and, and Gulf and Exxon put them there because they know they can get away with it. You're dealing with communities that have little or no political power. They can make noise, but they can't effectively resist and they suffer the consequences. Now, another component of this network of facilities that's being built to turn oil and gas into plastic are these enormous industrial facilities called cracker plants. And this is a picture of one that's under construction right now. It's on the banks of the Ohio River. There's the river down there on the left side, uh, outside, outside Pittsburgh. And this enormous factory, I read that it uh, entails a cost of six billion dollars. This is a, a basically an enormous chemical factory that's going to take oil and natural gas and turn it into the feedstocks, uh, the uh, ethane and ethylene dioxide uh, that are required to, to, produce, to produce plastic. And here's a, another one down in Texas. This is one that's already built. You can see the towers in the background, a place called Port Comfort. And you can see like so many of these things, it's built in a poor neighborhood. This is not a wealthy suburb. It's, a, it's where poor people live and they've got this chemical factory, huge plants sprawling across here in, right in their backyard. So there's a group of us, Judith Hank and Megan Wolf are part of a group of about 35 or 40 people from around the world who have formed something called the Mindaroo Monaco Commission on Plastics and Human Health. And we're working to understand and enumerate the full impact that plastic has on human health across its life cycle from production through use and onto disposal. And we've, we've tracked, I won't go through this in, in detail, need about six hours to work it through, but suffice it to say that the, the processes here are very, very, very complicated, but they all begin with coal, oil, and gas and they all end with taking the stuff and throwing it away and having it end up in the ocean or on the land. And it's associated with disease and death at every stage of the life cycle. So uh, workers, the coal miners, the oil field workers, the men and women who work in plastic plants are at risk of a whole range of cancers and neurological conditions that I've listed here not to speak of heart disease and lung disease. Fence line communities, the communities right beside the cracker plants and the oil fields and the pipelines are exposed to the benzene and the 1,3-butadiene and the formaldehyde. Those are ca cancer causing chemicals that are associated with, with pipelines and leak into these communities that already suffer disproportionate rates of disease and death. And then in the use phase, when you and I and every one of us use plastics, we're exposed to those chemical additives that sneak out of the plastics, get into us, get into our households, get into our children and grandchildren. Plastic is not benign. And it's not just microplastics at the end of the line, as some people think. It's disease, disability, and death across the whole life cycle of plastic. This is a bit of an eye test, but this is a, a list of just some, not all but just some of the many chemicals that go into plastic. It's estimated that there are more than 10,000 different chemicals go into plastic. As I said earlier in this talk, very, very few of them have ever been tested for toxicity. They're ubiquitous in plastic, they're everywhere, and they get into us and they cause disease. Infants in the womb and little babies are especially susceptible to plastics. I speak to this because I'm a pediatrician. A lot of my own research is going back to the work I did 50 years ago on lead, has looked at how children are exquisitely vulnerable to toxic chemicals, much more so than adults. And there's several reasons for that. We've studied this extensively and we found that the fundamental issue, the fundamental difference between adults and children is not size but it's rather the fact that babies are growing and developing at an extraordinary rate. And these processes are not random, they're tightly scripted, they're very carefully choreographed. Millions of operations have to take place 
in the proper sequence, one after another, after another. And if anything gets into a baby's body and disrupts those complicated processes, the result is disease, cancers, birth defects, mental retardation. It's so important to protect babies. That's why practicing uh, OBGYNs tell women not to drink, not to smoke, not to take recreational drugs during pregnancy. But quite apart from alcohol, drugs, and tobacco, there are all these manufactured chemicals that women, pregnant women are exposed to every day and get into their baby and they can damage the baby at levels way below the levels that would harm an adult. And these are some of the consequences, brain damage, birth defects, cancer. It's especially dangerous during pregnancy because that's when development is proceeding at the most rapid rate. And there's no such thing as a threshold uh, when it comes to prenatal exposure. You and I can tolerate some exposure to a toxic chemical. We're adults, our bodies are formed, we're not rapidly growing and developing. And it's some, sometimes at least it's possible to talk about thresholds when you're talking about adult exposure, but there are no safe thresholds when you're talking about babies. And the brain damage that plastic causes can, plastic chemicals cause can result in IQ loss and autism and attention deficit disorder. And the only way to deal with this, the only way to protect babies is to prevent exposure in the first place. These conditions are not untreatable, but extremely difficult to treat, awfully hard to help children develop the workarounds to cope with things like attention deficit disorder and IQ loss. Much more effective, much better, much more humane to prevent the conditions from happening in the first place. We've also brought economists into the conversation, not because I see any virtue in attaching a dollar value to human suffering, but still, when you have to persuade elected officials in Albany, in Boston, in Washington, Sacramento, to do something about toxic chemicals in the environment, toxic chemicals in plastic, it's important to show them the health effects, to talk about children's diseases and adult heart attacks. But it's also important to show them that these diseases cost money, lots of money, billions upon billions of dollars. And we all have to realize that the people who make the plastic and make the chemicals are not the people who pay these billions of dollars. No, no. What they do is they, quote, externalize these costs, which is a way of, polite way of saying that they take these costs, write them off, and shift them on to the rest of us so that it's citizens, it's taxpayers, it's governments that pick up the costs of the damages caused by plastic. These are healthcare costs. These are the decreased productivity of people that are damaged by these chemicals. It's damages to the environment. It's damages to agriculture. It's damages to fisheries. All of these are shoved off onto the general public by the petrochemical and plastic companies. That's a, a huge point that sometimes gets missed in this conversation. Okay, I talked at the beginning uh, of this talk about planetary boundaries. And back when I showed you that graph before, I didn't make the point of it at all, but the segment of the planetary boundary that talked about chemical and plastic pollution was left blank because 15 years ago when uh, uh, Dr. Rockstrom first developed the concept of planetary boundaries, they didn't have enough information on chemical and plastic pollution to, uh, to venture an estimate of where, where things stood. But things have changed. In, in those 15 years, plastic production has almost doubled. It's, it's just increasing at rocket speed right now. And measurements, we have much better measurements on how much is in the environment. And the people in Sweden who keep track of these things have come to the conclusion that chemical and plastic pollution are approaching a tipping point, just like climate change, just like biodiversity loss. They're reaching a tipping point where the continuing unchecked accumulation of plastics and chemicals in the Earth's environment could irreversibly damage the planet's support systems and threaten the very survival of more modern civilizations. So here's that same picture I showed you before. There's climate change at the top, and there's biodiversity loss. And here's the new one. 
This is chemical and plastic pollution, which now is so severe that uh, the people that study these things believe it's threatening planetary support systems. So that's all the bad news, but let me conclude in the last few minutes here by talking about the good news. And the good news here, quite fundamentally, is that plastic pollution can be prevented. It is, after all, a problem that we humans created through our behavior, or at least through the behavior of some of us, and it's therefore a problem that can be prevented by changing that behavior. And the best evidence I have, the best, the best cause for optimism is that many countries around the world, including the United States, have done a very good job of controlling other forms of pollution. And we're saving lives, we're preventing disease by doing that. And the way we do it is we pass laws, we establish policies, we do monitoring, and we give incentives. Think about air pollution, for example. We've had air pollution laws in this country since 1970. Uh, and uh, in that time, we have reduced air pollution levels in the United States by almost 75%. It's a huge reduction. Air quality is way better today across the country than it was when Richard Nixon signed the Clean Air Act in 1970. Um, and clean up of Boston Harbor, where I live, the removal of lead from gasoline, bans on single-use plastic, extended producer responsibility. These are all examples of how governments, national governments, state governments, have successfully cleaned up pollution, saved lives, and not by way of no harm, uh, conveyed a lot of benefit to the economy. We know how to do it. So the issue is not technology. The issue is politics, it's political will, it's special interests, it's corruption. So if you're going to prevent pollution and disease, what do you need? You need scientists who discover what's going on. The scientists have to step out of their laboratories. The doctors have to step out of their hospitals and speak in the public arena, tell people what's happening. That's what we're doing here tonight. Elected officials and policymakers need to, be, need to listen. We've all seen what happens when high elected officials ignore science, pretend that it doesn't exist. People die. It's for it, elected officials, policymakers have a responsibility, a moral responsibility to listen to the scientists and act on the basis of the evidence. And to recognize that the fossil carbon industry is the root of the problem here and have the courage to confront that massive industry. So let's talk about a few success stories because it's always good to have talk about victories after we've been talking about the bad things. We talked about DDT early on. So way back in the early 1970s, the courageous woman scientist, Rachel Carson, discovered that DDT was killing eagles and ospreys, that was driving those, those birds extinct. She wrote a book, some of you will have read, called Silent Spring, an iconic book. It was, it was a powerful, powerful piece of literature. It persuaded the Congress and Richard Nixon, President Nixon, to create the Environmental Protection Agency. And one of the first things that the EPA did when it was formed was to ban DDT. And in the 50 years since then, the ospreys and the eagles have rebounded. They're coming back. We took lead out of gasoline. And as Megan mentioned in her introduction, when we removed lead from gasoline, we saw children's blood levels drop by 95%. We saw every child in America born since 1980 be smarter because they were not burdened by low level lead toxicity. I've already mentioned control of air pollution, clean up of Boston Harbor. Uh, we've gotten lots of the worst pesticides out of the food supply, not all of them by any means, but a lot of them have been gotten out since we passed the Food Quality Protection Act. And the we were not all dying of melanoma caused by solar ultraviolet radiation because the nations of the world got together through the Montreal Protocol and stop the manufacture of the chemicals called chlorofluorocarbons that were destroying the high level stratospheric ozone layer that protects the earth against ultraviolet. So how do we prevent chemical and plastic pollution? We've got to begin at the beginning. We need to fundamentally restructure the policy, 
that allows chemicals to come onto the market without any testing. I don't think most people realize. You go into you go into Home Depot, you go into Target, you go into CVS, you see all sorts of stuff on the shelves, beautifully packaged, and you say to yourself, "It must be it must be okay. It's sitting here. It's for sale. Somebody in the government must be looking looking over." It's not happening, except for pharmaceuticals and vaccines. The chemicals that go into consumer products are almost 100% unregulated. It's buyer beware when you buy a chemical product, don't presume that anybody at all has tested the stuff. The only way to keep yourself safe is to reduce your footprint, minimize your purchases of chemicals, minimize your purchases of plastics. You can't get by without them. Of course, nobody pretends you can, but you can get by with less. And at the legal level, the so-called precautionary principle, which says simply, Chemicals have to be proven safe before they're put on the market, not presumed innocent until they're proven guilty. And some people have talked about the need for a United Nations High Commission on Chemicals and Plastic Pollution, like the internet, like the intergovernmental intergovernmental um, uh, panel on on climate change. So, what do, what do we do? What do we do as individuals? What do our governments do? What should we be asking our elected officials to do? Firstly, get rid of unnecessary uses of plastic, especially sing single-use plastic. Require the manufacturers to take responsibility for the stuff that they're currently dumping on the rest of us. This is called extended producer responsibility. And it, it, one way that we're all familiar with that it plays out is the bottle deposit laws. When you buy a bottle of Coke, there's a five cent or a 10 cent deposit on it, depending on what state you're in. And when you return that bottle at the end of the use, end of use, you get your money back. That's an example, a very homely, but very effective example of extended producer responsibility. And it's been amazingly effective in cleaning up bottle pollution across the country. But most other plastics, no such thing. People make the stuff, put it into products, wash their hands and laugh all the way to the bank while we pick up the bill. Extended producer responsibility turns that around. Another action which California has recently taken is it requires plastic manufacturers to kick into a fund every year to clean up landfills and other places that have been polluted by plastic. A longer term strategy is to design safer, more sustainable materials. Plastics don't have to be made out of toxins. The petrochemical industry is doing it because it's cheap and easy, but there is a better way to go and they have to be compelled to take it. We need to do biomonitoring. I mentioned the surveys that currently take place across the United States measuring plastic chemicals in our bodies. Uh, chemical uh, countries around the world have to do this kind of stuff because it's hard to control things that you can't measure. And if you get a handle on measuring how much people are exposed to, then you can do something about controlling the problem. Got to have better policies on waste disposal. And finally, we need to develop a legally binding global treaty on plastics. The negotiations are going on as we speak, and we need to be sure that it's done right, that it's effective, and that people buy into it just the way they bought into the global Paris Accords on climate change. Judah said this at the beginning, and I just want to reiterate, plastic recycling does not work. It's a scam. Only 8%, eight or maybe 9%, to be generous, of all plastic produced in this country is recycled. This is a big contrast with paper, 68%, glass, 90%, aluminum, 75%, 80%. And the reason it can't be recycled is not because people aren't conscientious. You know, People are very careful. They put the plastic in one place and the paper another and the glass in the third. We all think we're doing the right thing. But the problem is, is when that plastic gets to the recycling center, they can't recycle it because it's so chemically complex and it's got so many toxic materials in it, it's useless. You can't take toxic recycled plastic and wrap string beans in it, not unless you want to poison people. So how do they recycle it? They burn the damn stuff. They put it into a furnace and burn it and send the fumes up into the atmosphere. Or the other thing, and this counts as recycling right now under US law, they put it on a boat, 
they ship it to places like Malaysia, this picture here, and it piles up in huge stacks on beaches in landfills where people of every age, small children, are employed as waste pickers going through and picking out the choicest bits, five-year-olds, seven-year-olds. We've all heard it said that pollution is the price of progress. We've all heard it said that pollution control kills the economy, costs jobs. This little graph, which was published a few years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, puts the lie to both those claims. So what's going on here? This is looking at the United States from 1970 to 2016. And this line here going down from left to right shows the decline in emissions of air pollution over those years, 75% decline in air pollution since 1970. This green line at the top here, that's the gross domestic product, the GDP, which is an aggregate measure of the health of the American economy. And the GDP grew by 250% in the very same period of time as we knocked down air pollution by 75%. Every dollar that we put into air pollution control has yielded a return of $30. That's a very, very good investment. Uh, the petrochemical industry doesn't want you to know that, but it's the truth. Another piece of good news is that the cost of producing electricity from the sun and from the wind has plummeted in just a decade. Every country in the world, the USA, uh, China, India, the price to producing electricity from the sun is way down in the bottom end of the range of costs that it takes to produce electricity from coal, gas, and oil. Basically, in most parts of the United States, it's cheaper today to produce electricity from wind and sunshine than from oil or gas. The fossil fuel industry is fighting that. They're building out the pipeline network frantically to try to lock people in because they know how this is coming, how this is shaping up, but this is the reality. I'll stop there and as time permits, I'm open for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Landrigan. That was tremendous. Um, I wish we had time for questions, uh, but we've actually almost reached the end of the hour. Um, what I do want to say to the audience is that we can field your questions at Beyond Plastics, and we want to. Um, this has been an amazing lecture. The growing research on the health impacts of plastics is one of the reasons why we at Beyond Plastics are so focused on ending plastic pollution. We have to reduce the production of unnecessary plastics. We have to address the toxic exposures that come from the unregulated chemical additives in plastics. Audience, you're not done yet because we want you to get involved and we want you to ask your questions to us. If we can't answer them directly, we can get the answers from people like Dr. Landrigan. For information on how to combat plastic pollution, please have a look at our website, which is www.beyondplastics.org. But you don't need to do it alone. We want you to get involved directly with us and our work by clicking on Become a Volunteer Leader, which is going to show you how to take our free grassroots trainings and why. We need all the help we can get. To grow the grassroots movement, we're rolling out a national network of local groups who are ready to take this on, and we want you to be a part of it. Your time and your voice are the most important tools for making change happen. But we also smile on financial donations that help us meet the operating budget and keep the low energy lights on. So if you have the means to give, do so. Um, but before we conclude for the evening, I wanna hand the spotlight back over to Judith who has an announcement about the next Beyond Plastics webinar. Spoiler alert, even if I didn't do this professionally, there is no way that I would miss what's coming up next. Thanks, Megan. So we do quarterly webinars on hot topics that we think you're interested in. And it's amazing. We had 545 attendees tonight. And it reminds me of that great saying, when the people lead, the leaders will follow. And that's how we're going to prevail on this issue. So take out a pen and paper. Our next webinar for you will be a little different. I will have the honor of interviewing Bill McKibben, who is a remarkable climate change advocate and writer, the founder of 350.org. 
along with Elizabeth Colbert, who is a writer for The New Yorker, who's written the book, The Sixth Extinction, that you should read and many other books. Um, both Bill McKibben and Elizabeth Colbert are amazing thinkers and writers. Andrew, my colleague, just dropped into the chat the registration information, and we'll also send it to you. So this next uh, webinar, which is an interview, will be on April 13th at 7 p.m. Eastern. And I just want to say we're, we're entering the Martin Luther King holiday weekend, the uh, Dr. King's commemoration is this Monday. And I know that this is an overwhelming issue, especially the environmental justice connections. Dr. Landrigan spoke so eloquently about how we need to focus on production, use, and disposal because it's low-income communities and communities of color that are most hurt by all of those things. So I just wanna leave you with the MLK quote, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Thank you, Dr. Landrigan for this stellar presentation. And we're so grateful that you are our partner in, in doing this work. We will prevail over time and we thank you all for tuning in uh, today. See you on April 13th, if not sooner. Good night.